My name is Neil Marks. We're here with uh, Dr. Dan Baker, the head of LASP. Uh, we'll be talking about the costs of space weather. My name is Dan Baker. I'm the director of the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, and I also chaired a National Research Council panel that tried to look at the economic and societal impacts of space weather, tried to assess the economic impacts, as you say. So. And so what exactly is space weather? What are we talking about here? I thought space was kind of empty. So. Space weather is thought of as the um, disturbances on the sun and the um, effects that those have on the Earth, its environment, and ultimately perhaps the effect that the space environment has on human technology. So this can be effects on satellites in space. It can be effects on power grids and other things on Earth. It can affect communication. It can affect a whole range of things around the Earth um, associated with um, the general variability of the sun and, and the space environment. How exactly does there's this stuff coming off of the sun? Right. What, what is it doing that's can cause problems with the power grid or? Yeah, uh, the disturbances from the sun in general can change the uh, kinds of currents. If you, th if you think about the Earth and its environment as a large magnetic and electrical envelope that's around us, then the, the changes from the sun can disturb that electrical and magnetic envelope. It can cause dramatic changes in the behavior of the system. It can cause uh, powerful currents to be induced. For example, consider the electrical power grid. That's one of the perfect examples of this. Um, if you consider the North American continent, we can have power grids that um, long lines of, um, that are carrying electrical power. These can extend for thousands of kilometers. And uh, if you have induced currents in the Earth's ionosphere, those that can indu in turn induce currents flowing in the electrical power grid. And as these currents change and as they fluctuate, um, this can cause powerful heating in the transformers that are part of the power grid. And those fluctuations can cause, in fact, failures of the uh, extremely high voltage uh, transformers, burn them out. Each of these transformers cost literally millions of dollars. They, um, if, they're, if they fail, um, we don't have a whole bunch of those in reserve. We have to build new ones to replace them. And in the study that, uh, that I oversaw, we um, looked at some modeling that had gone on for uh, earlier times. And um, it's quite possible that we could lose literally hundreds of these high voltage transformers each of them costing, as I mentioned, several million dollars, tens of millions of dollars perhaps to replace, and that it might be take months to years to replace the uh, transformers. So imagine that we were without electrical power for uh, weeks, months, perhaps years, uh, in a large segment of, the, of North America, in the eastern United States, for example. So it's not unreasonable to think about uh, that we could have power failures that would be long lasting and would be extremely damaging to our society. You think about that electrical power uh, is related to, of course, pumping water, so having potable water, having fuel, uh, the uh, gasoline and, and oil and other things we depend on really require electrical power to be provided. The communication systems that we rely on are all dependent on electrical power, banking and finance, all of the different things that make up a modern society are dependent on this sort of cornerstone technology of the electrical power grid. And so uh, a failure in one segment of society can propagate through the entire, uh, all of society. And this is, uh, this is the kind of thing that economists really would like to assess better. Okay, well, the space environment becomes very important yes. to all aspects of our, yes. our economy. And yes. if how strong of a solar event would we need to, to cause something devastating? Well, we know that, uh, that a, a strong, uh, that is a, a, um, a, a strong but not a typically strong event, for example, uh, in uh, a solar maximum a couple of cycles ago in 1989, caused a major power outage in Canada that propagated and nearly uh, took out uh, the uh, northeastern United States in that particular failure. Um, a, uh, a modest kind of event that actually wasn't related to uh, space weather, but it, was, it showed the vulnerability of the power system 
occurred in August of 2003 when the uh, power grid was knocked out in the Great Lakes area and again in the northeastern United States. That power failure caused uh, an estimated four to ten billion dollars of economic impact to uh, society. It caused an outage that lasted several days and um, and when if you just take that as an example of what a moderate storm could do then you realize that this could be extremely costly to uh, to any um, in any societal sense. Um, the largest storm that we know about from the relatively recent historical record was the what is called the Carrington event. This was observed by Richard Carrington, uh, a solar astronomer in Great Britain in 1859. This uh, storm has been analyzed and assessed in retrospect and it was judged that this was at least four, possibly as much as ten times more intense than anything we've seen in the modern space age. Um, it produced uh, energetic particles more copious and more intense than, than anything we've seen in the, uh, in the modern space era. Um, it caused aurora and uh, fluctuations in the, uh, in the uh, electromagnetic currents around the Earth extending down to uh, at least to Cuba, possibly down to even lower latitudes. So ordinarily storms have their major effects in mid-latitudes or higher latitudes mm -hmm. on the Earth. When, when the aurora are seen, powerful disturbances are, are seen as low as India and Cuba, you know that this is an extremely powerful event. And um, it's judged that if an event of that sort were to occur in, with uh, modern society, with modern technology, that we'd probably have dramatic effects on the power grid, as I was talking to you about, about communications. Uh, the effects on, on communications would be dramatic. Uh, we also know that this would... Uh, cause uh, substantial problems for airline traffic, a lot of things that weren't around in 1859. The uh, principal technology that was present in 1859 was the telegraph system. Um, there were long lines running for the telegraphs. Very powerful currents were induced there. There was extreme heating. Uh, fires were actually caused to break out. They used paper to record telegraph signals paper caught on fire, there were actual fires in these stations, people died in those fires, so, mm -hmm. so there was a, a significant effect in that sense. Also during the Carrington event, people were actually able to read newspapers by aurora light in, in the northeastern United States. The aurora were so powerful. Mm -hmm. Now imagine what that would do to the global positioning system satellites and communication satellites that we rely on trying to send signals through the ionosphere. So as you start to compare these earlier events when we had very, very primitive technology comparatively to today, you can see that, that we're much, much more sensitive, much more vulnerable to these kinds of uh, effects today than we were in these earlier times. But they, these earlier events do tell us that it's not unreasonable to expect much stronger events than we've seen uh, even in the recent uh, 10, 20, 30 decades, you know, 10, 20, 30 years uh, recent times. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank, you. Baker. thank you. Thank you very much.